Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our research forum. It's wonderful to have uh, to welcome our colleague, Dr. Amanda Babington, to today's research forum, and she's going to be um, talking about the Masset and, and also performing for us, which is, is brilliant. And her presentation is called Researching Forgotten Composers. Amanda has been a lecturer at the RNCM for about 10 years or perhaps more, but for a while. Yeah, same as you. <laughs> same time as me. Okay, that's true. Seven years. <laughs> um, she is a recorded player, a, a Baroque violinist, and a musette player. Not many of us can have um, such high level of skills in, in all of those areas. She's also a musicologist, and she combines all of these in, in very interesting ways. She um, directs the Baroque in the North. Um, ensemble and she's involved in the Aberdeen Early Music Collective, has worked with many other ensembles in, in, in this country and, and elsewhere. Um, we have some exciting news that her first album, Music for French Kings, um, on, um, featuring the Mazette, is coming out in August, so that's very exciting and I think there'll be more details at the end of the, the presentation. Um, Amanda has um, edits um, music and has a Baron Writer edition of the Dettinger um, Te Deum of Handel. Um, it's been out for many years and is very highly respected. She has a number of peer review articles as well and performances all over Europe. And I believe that you perform as the early music show coming up as well. So it, the, the, that juggling act of, of so many different very complementary skills is a real feature of Amanda's achievements to date. So I look forward to the presentation. I'd like you to welcome Amanda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I thought I would begin just by playing a few notes on the instrument in question. The, the form is really about the composers um, that this instrument led me towards and the, the various sort of surprises that I've had along the way. Um, but I think in order to really understand the, the whole sort of picture around what I'll be talking about, um, you need to understand what the instrument is and what its background really was. Um, this is a, a modern copy of an instrument by Nicolas Chedeville, um, who was working on these instruments in the early 18th century. And the instrument itself had um, a fairly short shelf life as what we might call a high art instrument. Um, as with all bagpipes, its origins are pastoral, um, played by shepherds and shepherdesses. And it's really down to um, its patronage by Louis XIV and then subsequently Louis XV that it really rose to prominence as a high art instrument. Um, it started off, in fact, um, as just a single chanter or chalumeau. So we have a grand chalumeau and a petit chalumeau here. And the keys that you see on it were all developments of the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Um, as with all things royal um, in France during that period, um, where the kings went, the aristocracy would follow. And so it was soon adopted by the aristocracy. There were many uh, instances of people learning it. And there's a good trade in musicians, um, of which there were two dynasties, who played and made and taught the instrument as well as composing for it. So it was a bit of a sort of mini industry. Um, and then there's also a large body of work dedicated to um, musette amateur pieces, pieces that tend to use only the grand chalumeau. Um, it started to fade really in the 1760s as it reached its kind of peak development, um, but its, its fortune is totally sort of caught up in the fortunes of the French aristocracy. Um, and given that it was patronised by the court at Versailles um, and various echelons of the aristocracy, you can understand why it didn't sort of survive past uh, the revolution. Um, which is a bit sad, really, given that it's a, a, a lovely instrument and that the, it started off with this great body of work. Um, but fortunately, a few examples were um, saved. They, they were placed in the um, Paris Conservatoire. Um, and around the 1960s, um, so we're talking about a big gap here from the end of, of the 18th century to the 1960s, um, the instrument was revived. And I mean, that's a bit of a grand way of putting it, actually. It was uh, rediscovered by a maker um, and two uh, bagpipe players, one of whom was a musicologist. 
and they worked away on it in really quite splendid isolation for decades, um, gradually persuading um, people putting on French Baroque operas to include it so that it got a bit more sort of prominence. But just to give you an idea of the scale of particularly musicology that surrounds it, um, there are probably maybe six what you might term professional players of this instrument in the world. Um, and there are, there are a number of amateur players. Most people come to it via their own bagpiping tradition. Um, so there are in fact only really two of us that have come to it from the classical music tradition. Um, one of the, the sort of original rediscoverers of it um, was himself classically trained and it's only really his musicology that was published and that really consists of about one and a half papers. So there's, there's really almost nothing published. This is being addressed now mainly through iconography um, to do with the instrument. It features in many, many paintings, not just from its period um, during the 17th and 18th centuries, but later on in the 19th century, we see it reappearing in paintings that sort of hark back to pastoral times and you know, seeing the, the sort of beauty of the um, 18th century. Um, so that's the, the status of the instrument today. Um, I won't go into why, how I ended up playing it. It was a hobby that went wrong or, or got a bit out of hand, shall we say. Um, but as, with, as Barbara said, um, I sort of mix musicology and performance. And so for me, they're always indelibly linked. And there are various elements of music, particularly music repertoire, that um, I just can't let go. As a musicologist, I need to know more about pieces and composers and who composed them, who that composer was, um, what the forms were, etc. Contextualizing it all as as we do as musicologists. Um, so be before I get into the, the general picture of repertoire, I'll just uh, let you have a, a listen to the sound of it. One of a, a, a suite composed by Jean Hotter um, in the uh, very early 18th century, which references the pastoral origins. It's called Marche des Bergères, Mar March of the Shepherds. Um, and what we generally see with Musette's repertoire is um, that it follows the fortunes of much French Baroque music, except that it has a sort of extra string to its bow, as it were, in that it does reference pastoral. Um, imagery and, and forms really actually throughout its life. It's often used like that in operas, um, in early Lully operas, late Rameau operas. So that's one strand. Um, the other strand that pervades its repertoire is the, the French um, sort of penchant for um, dance. So we see a lot of dance forms in Musette's repertoire. And then as the centuries progress, we see the, the sort of introduction of the Italian, uh, style as we see elsewhere in French Baroque music. So we see sonata form sort of coming through. Um, but this just keeps getting peppered with these kind of pastoral uh, sort of you know, shepherds marches and, and things like that. So that's a slight sort of anom anomaly in comparison with the general trends. Um, now I speak rather grandly about musette repertoire as if it's all kind of done and dusted and, and someone's made a catalogue of it and so on and so forth. In fact, we couldn't be further from the truth. Um, when I started uh, learning the instrument, um, I started with one of the, the original sort of discoverers um, in Toulouse. And, and I'd go, uh, I think I managed about eight months of lessons with him before he sadly passed away. And I'd rock up to his house with my instrument, um, really not knowing anything. 
and he'd produce a piece of music and go, let's play this today. And I'd think, oh, okay, great, fine. Um, and I'd think, oh yeah, Charpentier, great, brilliant. I know Charpentier, yeah, fine. Um, and I'd you know, be busy learning the mechanics of the fingering and that stuff. Um, and it wasn't actually until he passed away that I suddenly thought, hang on, I actually don't know anything about this instrument other than vaguely how to coordinate my, my two arms at that point. Um, so I, I was fortunate in that I was able to go for lessons to one of the other pioneers um, in Belgium. And this time, because I realized that how much I didn't know, some of what I didn't know, um, I tried to get more of a sense of the, the body of repertoire. And this guy is really knowledgeable, Jean-Pierre Van Hayes. Um, but again, there's a slightly haphazard approach. So I said to him, well, where is all this music? And he said, oh, it's, it's on my MSLP and, and Gallica. So if you type in Musette, you, you get some pieces, um, but they're not all labeled Musette, of course. Uh, so there's, there's a, quite, quite a number of holes. Um, and eventually I discovered that he did have a sort of library that he'd shared with the other rediscoverer, my first teacher. Um, and in, in return for doing some translation for him on his book about bagpipes, um, he shared his library with me. So I inherited a whole load of uh, um, 18, mostly 18th century prints, um, which was great. I thought, brilliant, this is it. And then I thought, actually, I don't think it is. There's, he talks about a lot more than, 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 than is there. Um, so I started myself trying to systematically go through IMSLP and, and Gallica. Um, and then um, there was an inaugural Rouen-based um, Musette conference, a whole three-day conference devoted solely to Musettes in 2018, um, 2019 it was, um, where I met um, uh, a guy called Dominique Paris, who runs a group called Les, Seren Les Serenades du Ver Galant, which is a, a, a general kind of pastoral-ish, it's a very French society. They do a lot of dressing up, a lot of reenactment, um, a lot of, which incorporates music, but isn't solely devoted to it, um, and brings together lots of different people from different walks of life. Um, and he very generously said, oh, I've got a library to share as well, so give me a, you know, hard, a, a disc and I'll, I'll burn it to you. So I inherited another library, some of which overlapped with the first. Um, and again, I went through it systematically, trying to work out, trying to say, get some idea of an overview of you know, maybe form, who was writing. And so I began my, my list, so you'll see in a minute. Um, again, this kind of, this is a very unmusicological approach. It, to me, anyway, it's a very unfamiliar um, approach. Maybe partly because I've come from a different field. My, my published field is, is in Handel, on which there has been so much research done. Um, and so starting afresh like this, it seems a little unlikely. Um, and so at every step of the way, I find myself doubting and thinking, there must be some stuff. Somebody must have published on this. So this has been a sort of persistent, recurrent um, thought. Um, I did find uh, a very useful book. Um, this one here, the hurdy-gurdy in 18th century France. Um, yes, it's not Musette, but there's a connection between um, the Vihel, as it's known in, in France, and the Musette in that many pieces were published for one or other instrument, or for, rather for both. Um, they had a shared pastoral sort of novelty, um, and their history is a little bit similar in terms of who adopted them. Um, so it's a good place to start. Um, and this has a very useful section in the back of the book where Robert Green, the author, has collated all of the, it made lists of repertoire essentially for Vihel. So if you comb that, you can find the pieces that are also listed for Musette. So that was quite a good um, uh, sort of find. Um, and what I noticed when I'd done all this was that there are a number of names that were really unfamiliar to me, and um, even ones that were actually violin composers like Anne, I'd never come across, um, which made me feel slightly bad actually. Um, so. Again, that kind of hit a nerve because I thought, hang on, as a, as a Baroque violinist, I, sh I should know more about this stuff. Why don't I know more about French Baroque composers? 
And actually, there's a quite practical reason for that, which is that in the UK, French Baroque music is not played much. Um, I think I can probably count on the fingers of half a hand, actually, how many times I've, I've done concerts here uh, with French Baroque music. Uh, I know a bit more because I worked for a number of years with a Paris-based ensemble. If I hadn't done that, actually, maybe I would never come to Musette, I'm not sure. But I certainly wouldn't be familiar with a lot of the operatic repertoire, for example. Um, so there is a sort of um, cultural disconnect, in a way, that's based on the kind of practicalities of my performing life. Um, so that kind of left me at the point where I wanted to see if there were other works by these composers whose names I had managed to, to trace in order to start building up a picture of who composed for the instrument, what they composed, and then maybe why as well. Um, so I thought I'd start with opera, so I'd print it very small here in an effort to um, try and get as many names on the slides as is feasibly possible. You don't actually need to, to read the details anyway. It's more or less to give you an impression of um, the number of composers and the number of works that we're talking about here. Um, so we have the two operatic giants, Lully and Rameau, um, famously at Loggerheads, of course, um, and they bookend French Brock opera. And so it's really interesting, actually, that they both use Musette because Really, anything that Lully did, Rameau didn't. Um, that was really the, the, the whole sort of premise um, of their, their battle. Um, and in fact, you can probably see the number of works that Rameau dedicated uh, to the Musette, starting in 1733 with the Bouillet d'Arici and then finishing with Les Paladins in 1760. Um, and Lully's uh, date back to, well, they're in some of his ballets actually. Um, but then in 1672. So they kind of show actually the, the early days of Musette and its kind of final swan song um, as well. Um, we then interestingly have composers who have included it in one opera. So Marais writes for it in Semele, Compra in a couple, uh, three, Les Ages, Les Muses, um, and Idomene, again for a very close period there, 1703 to 1718. Um, Mouret, Jean-Joseph Mouret, who I must confess I'd never heard of, um, uh, writes for it in, in Les Amours de Dieu. Um, Monteclair, uh, not too surprising because of his connections um, and his like of novelty as well. Um, Jacques Aubert, again, just a name actually, to me, I wasn't familiar with, with any of his works. Um, Boismotier, I'll, I'll say more about him later. Um, in the context of, of his other works, it's not surprising that he did include it in an opera. And then Leclerc in Scylla, Iglocus, and Combert, who wrote for it in three of his operas. Um, so alongside this, uh, I've been trying to pin down exactly what was written, um, and then actually, in a sort of modern day sense, to contemporize it, actually, has the, have these pieces been recorded? How well are they known? Um, what's the trend in people adopting the musette, as it were, because actually that then feeds into performance choices, um, for me, anyway. Um, so I would say probably, uh, I haven't done an exact calculation, but I would say less than 10% of these uh, operas have been recorded. Um, there's a big boom in over the, the 90s um, of French opera being recorded by um, uh, Les Arts Florissant and um, uh, the ensemble I used to work for, whose name now escapes me, um, uh, come back to me. Um, and so it's really from that period that we, we have most of the, of the recordings. Since then, the trend has died out slightly. And I've noticed with interest that a lot of the time, mostly they're written for two musettes. Uh, a lot of the time, if they are recorded or performed, they'll only use one musette. I think that's partly actually because of the, the, the few number of musettists. Um, and the fact that anybody employing the musettes, they're practical things. You, know, you want them to, to be familiar with each other. You want them to fit in. The, the usual kind of ensemble interests at play. Um, but it's interesting that that gets sacrificed for what I would see as a, a, a sort of rather large performance practice issue there, which gives you an idea of the kind of status of musette in these worlds um, today. The other issue that then has impact on performance is actually how 
um, easy is it to get scores of these works? And the answer is not, actually. Um, there are scores of many of them, um, and you can go to the Bibliothèque Nationale and, and access a lot of them. But actually, there are, um, there are often difficulties in, if you're doing it digitally, in getting enough, um, a high enough resolution to be able to trace the tiny lettering that indicates a musette because in the, the French orchestral texture, it joins the, the desus, um, the upper line melody part. Uh, so there'll just often be just a little scrawl that says, you know, musette or just muse. Um, so they're quite hard to trace visually. Um, and then often there might even not even be a reference specifically to musettes, but it might say pastoral or bergère. And that's the, the kind of clue there. So there's, you have to sort of put the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together. So I'm still working on a list of exactly what the musettes play in particularly the lesser known ones. Some of these are very well known, things like um, Les Ancalantes, for example, that's very often played um, and quite often with, with musettes. Um, interestingly, actually, the beginning of Les Ancalantes begins on a note that doesn't exist on this musette. And so another implication of that really ties together all the, the whole world of musette is that it was by tracing the, the musette part for Les Angalantes that led the original rediscoverers to realise that there's not just one type of musette, there are more. Um, and actually most of them exist in museums across the world. So there's, this is the sort of medium one. Um, you can get the piccolo version, which is um, a tone, it has a, a, it's a tone higher, not taken in terms of pitch, but in terms of uh, note. Um, so it's in A rather than G. Um, and then you get the Musette d'Amour, which as you might expect is the third lower. And then the one that's actually used at the beginning of Les Angalantes is a Musette de Raval, um, of which until all oh, that, a month ago, less than a month ago, there was no working one, there wasn't a whole one in existence. Um, it's just been recreated by um, a maker in Belgium, Bart Van Troyen, who bought a very smashed up bit of ivory that uh, he managed to recreate into, it was a, it had originally been a Musette Arval, um, but it was missing bits like the bell at the end. So piecing that together with um, the existing other bits of Musette Arval in, in museums across the world, he's managed to recreate it, which is an, an amazing um, piece of work. So it, it's this, that again gives you kind of picture into what this strange world is of discovery in in the world of musette. Um, okay, so if we move on from opera, we come to three pages of minor composers for musette. Now my, my um, sort of starting point with categorizing composers was really in some ways plucked out of the air um, and it was to do with how they're titled. So minor composers on my list anyway, are those who only wrote one or two pieces for musette or where musette's not named as the first instrument because in French uh, 18th, 17th, 18th century publications the order of the instruments that are named on the frontispiece um, actually is an indication of the composer's preference. So unlike um, uh, publications in the UK at the same time when it didn't really matter what order they occurred in, um, in French publications if you have musette first, that was the intended instrument, then vihel, then violin, etc. So these are all pieces that were um, either written for musette or where musette's mentioned on the frontispiece, but not as the first uh, instrument. And I've started to fill in some of these um, uh, details. Some of them I've got a relative amount of um, information on, like Alexandre and Besozzi. Uh, so he was the oldest son of uh, Joseph Benozzi, a musician who was born in Parma, died in Turin. This is an interesting point, actually, because he's one of the few non-French composers. Um, and he only left Turin twice, once for a short trip to Paris and the other time to um, see his birthplace. So uh, we know this because Bernie saw him in 1772 um, and he was an oboist. He was first oboist in the chamber and chapel for the King of Sardinia. Um, so his uh, writing for Musette is 
it's, it's not entirely for Musette, it's actually for Obo, but that he, the fact that he mentions Musette is interesting given that he only really went to Paris once. Um, he might have had contact with French musicians who came from Paris, but from the footfall that I've managed to trace, um, particularly between Paris and Rome, um, which is another research project, um, actually the, the footfall is, is quite minim sorry, minimal. Um, you can actually trace pretty much who went where because of court records um, and so on. And because, partly because of, um, in this case, Stuart's court spies as well, who reported back to um, Paris. Um, so he's one, and actually the information I found for him was in um, the Biographie Universelle des Musiciens uh, by Fetis. Um, and this brings me to one of the other points um, about researching this, which is that I find myself using much older scholarship to inform this than I would for Handel uh, research projects. Um, where I'm always using the most up-to-date research. Here, this is a, a bibliography that was published in 1835. For Handel studies, you discount anything that's you know, really 1950 um, as being old. But actually, there are there's a lot of things, a lot of names that don't exist in anything published after that. And yeah, I know that you're thinking, well, Oxford Music Online. Well, actually, there's a, there are many names that don't occur in Oxford Music Online, and there's a couple of issues around that as well, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so I find myself using um, uh, Fetis and um, also a, dic uh, a dictionary um, compiled by uh, Benoit, that, whose date I have somewhere. Um, oh yeah, Marcel de Benoit, um, that was republished in 1992, which again, I mean, in terms of handle scholarship, is fairly old. Um, but that's where I found some other details, uh, particularly of these musicians. Um, other names are a bit more better known, so Charles Boutern, for example, I know him uh, from Recorder Repertoire, um, the Marquis de Dampierre, names like that feature in uh, non-musical sources, you know, if they're a member of the aristocracy. You see them featured in sort of court circulars and things. Um, Charles Baton, I managed to trace his dates at least, um, unlike some of the others. So Jean-Daniel Bron, for example, um, known as Le Cadet, I haven't managed to find anything about him yet. Uh, so working on that. And the same with Thomas-Louis Joseph Bourgeois. <coughs> um, and then you get an even sparser page <laughs> where I really haven't managed to find much at all. Um, except about Felice Giardini, again, an Italian, um, and he was a violinist and composer of French descent, so there's the link there. Um, he was sent to Milan as a cathedral chorister and to study singing, composition and harpsichord, and then returned to Turin. So there, I suddenly think, hang on, that's Turin, mentioned twice. And you, under normal circumstances in musicology, you think that's really far-fetched. But actually, in this kind of research that I'm doing, actually, that is a, a red flag. That's something to remember, to make note of, and to think, I'll go back and, and examine Turin and circles and see if I can connect those two, and what's their connection to Paris, um, who do they know, who might they have studied with, etc. Um, so it's a real kind of jigsaw puzzle, and I've already had some success with that in uh, a, a separate research project that I'm conducting on um, Charles Edward Stewart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, who owned um, reportedly two musettes um, and whose playing period would have been when the Stuart Court was in Rome, which is why I've been tracing the footfall between Paris and Rome. And actually there, I, I have managed to join two random bits of information like that and create a little bit of a network. So it is worth doing. Um, some of these names I found by uh, finding articles on relatives. So Claude Desay, for example, um, I found his name in an Oxford Musical Online entry on Prosper Didier Desay. But there are a number of names there that I haven't managed to find out anything about yet. Um, the most annoying one so far of which is Charpentier. Um, and this was one of those pieces that I learned with the first teacher. And I thought, yay, Charpentier, I know that. Um, in fact, it's not Marc-Antoine, it's Colin. Um, who in, in amongst my uh, chamber ensembles is 
quite well known now, he's referred to as our friend Colin, um, because he's a totally unlikely character. We, I haven't managed to find out, or uh, there's virtually nothing to find about him, except that he was a virtuoso musettist. Um, he was a friend of Dongue, a, a viol player. Um, they made their debut at Versailles together. They performed in the Concert Spirituel. These are all well-known places. Um, and therefore, it's extremely frustrating that I have yet to find um, out anything about uh, Colin, his life, his dates, his provenance. Um, he only wrote one set of amusement for the musette. Um, so it's, that's an ongoing slight frustration. Um, and then there are these names about which I haven't found anything yet. And then here, the tiny writing, um, that's just to give you an idea of there are more names there about which about whom I haven't even managed to find dates. Uh, there are some, Monteclair, of course, I have his dates. Um, Pierre de la Garde, Louis Derachet, Jean Hotter. These um, Hotter I've managed to trace because of the, the sort of dynastic timeline. So there are plenty of articles that mention one of the Hotter and you can piece them together. Um, uh, de la Lande, he's relatively well known for choral works. Um, but not for his uh, instrumental works. And so I can find his dates, and I can find a little bit about his provenance, not a huge amount, given the number of choral works that he wrote and which are performed. Um, it's, it's all a bit lopsided. So uh, De La Lande is an example. Um, you can freely find his choral pieces on discs. Um, uh, sometimes even a whole disc devoted to him. But I haven't managed to find the, the sort of basic level of scholarship around him. It's as if the music is kind of seized upon um, by performers with an interest in you know, historically informed performance and performance practice. Um, but it's not followed by, up by music, musicologists. It's not underpinned by the musicological world. Um, and again, I'm sort of still piecing together the, the musicological world around French Baroque because I'm relatively new to this field um, and I, thanks to particularly to the, uh, the conference in, in Rouen, I did make some really good uh, connections there so I have been able to actually ask French scholars um, about people like Colin Charpentier um, so that I know that I'm not completely getting it wrong um, and they confirm my impressions here. This, the picture that I have been building is in fact a, a true one and one of the things is that actually there were so many composers in that period. It's a really absolutely sort of flowering period of French music. So that's one of the issues. The other issue is, of course, the revolution. Um, a lot of pieces were, were lost or they were placed in depositories or they were secreted somewhere or they were taken out of France. Um, and so there's that, that physical kind of issue of discovery. Um, and the fact that post-revolution, understandably, there was a long gap of any scholarship into this anything that was considered you know, bourgeois. Um, so it, it makes sense once you kind of piece it together like that. Um, so that's the, the minor composers list, um, which should, should take us on to major composers. Um, now my criteria for these is that they wrote more than one or two pieces um, and that they're written specifically for Musette, or at least that they named it first on the, the frontispiece. And for these, for the most part, I think I have managed to find at least their dates and usually something um, about them. Um, a lot of them have biographical details on Oxford Music Online. So again, that sort of mirrors the amount of repertoire that they have written for the instrument and also how sort of on the money they were at the time, following the trends um, in French culture, musical culture. Um, so I've taken their details and I've compared them, uh, their works, to my list of musette repertoire to identify works with some successes and some surprises, actually. Um, so for example, um, Jean-Jacques Baptiste Annet, I've already mentioned, he was a, he was a, a virtuoso violinist and composer. Um, and he wrote um, a reasonable amount of work for, for musettes um, in amongst, I'm just going to put this, this part of the music down and drop it. Um, 
So he wrote a reasonable amount, both for violin and also for musette. He was very involved in the court at Versailles, so that makes sense. And um, he made his debut um, at court in 1701 with Fauquere and Couperin. Um, and his works are often dedicated to, particularly his musette works, to my friend Colin. Um, his first book of sonatas was um, in, the, in, in the Italian style, but his second book is French, which is kind of the wrong way around. Um, but his main sort of claim to fame is that he was widely regarded as the, the best uh, violinist of the French school of the early 18th century. Um, Corette is an interesting character actually because um, he's one of the few that left France at some point before 1773 and he visited England. He's known particularly for his various methods um, and his, he dedicated several works actually to Musette. And this is a rather a sort of reflection of the vogue for this instrument, particularly amongst the amateur market, because that was Corette's market. That's why he wrote his, his methods. He's one of the um, earliest, his was one of the earliest methods for cello playing. Um, um, and so it tends to be quite a simplistic sort of style of music. Um, Louis, Louis Le Maire, uh, again, unknown to me before pre Musette times. Um, his composition output is actually uh, mostly vocal, and he was a particularly prolific composer of cantati, um, and he contributed significantly to that form. Um, a number of those were performed at the Tuileries between 1728 and 1736, um, and amongst that vast number of cantatis sits uh, a suite pour la fielle ou la musette, which was composed around 1725. Um, and a lot of his cantati are accompanied by Musette or Michel, the rest being flutes and violins. So he sort of covered the, the gamut of the Dessus uh, instruments in vogue at the time. Um, the Tuileries, uh, the concerts there, really um, gives us an indication of his kind of network, that being uh, the kind of bourgeois aristocracy, not necessarily the, the kind of court circles, although of course there was some overlap. Um, Nodo, Again, unknown to be pre Musette, and yet he wrote a number of violin uh, sonatas. Um, he's mostly associated with flute, in fact, and his pu pupils and patrons were aristocratic and bourgeois. Um, and his kind of USP was really, he was a bit of an innovator, exploring and developing the Italian style. Um, his works for Musette tend to be also labelled for Vihel. Um, but although he did dedicate his Opus 14 sonatas to the virtuoso Vihel player, um, Donge, he lists the Musette first in several other published works, suggesting that he did differentiate between the two instruments. Um, and his writing for Musette is idiomatic. Um, he combines the instrument very sympathetically with other instruments. Um, moving just swiftly through some of these, Dupuis, um, Dupuis was actually a Vihel player himself, and so it's, it's hardly surprising that most of his works are dedicated firstly to Vihel, um, but they are strikingly suitable for Musette. There is a, a difference in the, um, the range of the two instruments, so a lot of the time you look at a work that lists Vihel first, and actually the majority of it is, is unplayable, you have to make too many octave uh, shifts, but Dupuis are really quite sympathetic, there's only the odd note here or there, um, so obviously had in mind Musette when he was writing them. Um, and then we get onto the dynasties. So Esprit Philippe de Chiriville, he was the older brother, um, and he was one of the two families, um, 18th century families, I mean, his dates aside, but it flourished in the 18th century. Um, and that he made, he was an oboist uh, and Musette maker, he developed, uh, added to the developments of, of the instrument. Um, his younger brother, so Esprit Philippe tends to compose in the sort of early French style with dance suites, um, alludes to uh, the, the pastoral elements, um, combines uh, Vihel again in some of the titles, um, but very idiomatic. His younger brother, Nicolas Chiriville, was a bit of a character. Um, you don't really need to read, you'd like to know. The, the list of works, but that's just to show you that the out, his, his output was big, actually. Um, 
And the, the interesting thing about Shelleville was um, he really publicised the instruments. He, he went to great lengths. He had many pupils. He sort of pushed the boundaries of style. Um, he writes a lot in the Italian style. He was an early adopter of it for the musette. Um, he developed the instrument uh, quite in, in significant ways, adding various keys, adding to the chromatic uh, range of it. Um, he also passed off a couple of works that he wrote as by other people. So Il Pastor Fido, um, a set of six sonatas that until 1997 were um, thought to be by Vivaldi, because that's the name under which they were published. Um, familiar to, to recorder players, they're a real kind of staple of the recorder repertoire. Um, I must say that they're interesting on Musette, mainly because of the modulations. So he modulates like Vivaldi does, um, which goes quite quickly and quite distantly from the key in which the drones are set. So for example, Sonata number six is in G minor. So you set your drones to G and D. G minor is one of the keys we can do. Um, but within the first eight bars, you're in uh, B flat major, followed swiftly by E flat major. Musicists, and particularly melodic line players like myself, don't really notice this. We get, we get used to it very quickly. But when you're playing with a harpsichordist for the first time, they tend to go look at you slightly askance and start sort of twitching slightly as we go through the various modulations, which can be quite normal. Um, uh, so that's the, the shitty wheels. Then we get on to um, Duguay, who, whose music is very interesting, actually, um, because it's quite unlike most other music I've played, actually. Um, and it's quite hard to say why, really, actually. Um, it's partly to, a lot to do with the style. I've got all my papers out of order here. I'm going to flap them for a minute. Um, and interestingly, actually, when I was looking for information on Duguay, I had to search uh, quite far. Here we are, back on track. Um, to find him. And in fact, I found this entry in the, the dictionary that I mentioned earlier. Um, so that these are these are all bear in mind that these are the major composers. Um, we then come on to the one of the problematic areas, which when you're looking up um, French composers, and this is particularly apparent when you're looking up digital resources like Oxford Music Online, which is how do you spell their name? So is it Philibert de la Vigne, or is it de la Vigne, or is it de la Vigne? Um, and looking up a physical dictionary, actually quite often they're referenced, so each one, will, each version will have a reference saying, you know, referring you back to where the entry is. But if you're looking up Oxford Music Online, you don't get each of the references. So that's actually one thing that I never actually thought about um, prior to this, but it, it concerns people like de la Lande as well. Um, and so it's a sort of extra thing to contend with. Um, de la Vigne, in whichever way you decide to, to split his name, um, this is an example, an absolutely typical example too, of where I found myself sometimes um, when I've looked for information um, on these composers. Um, and that's that I found myself consulting sources like Wikipedia, um, which I use to sort of hang my head in shame. Um, but actually, it's, it's the one place that comes up when you Google De La Vie. Um, interestingly, though, the information on the Wikipedia entry actually comes from Robert Greene, the book I mentioned at the beginning about uh, music for, for Hurdy Gurdy. Um, and the one thing that isn't referenced at all on the Wikipedia page, which I haven't managed to get to the bottom of yet, is the top paragraph um, where it says that he was active at the court of Louis XV and entered the service of the Comte de Dien around 1730. There's no reference there, typical Wikipedia, no reference. Um, and that's the one piece of information on that page that doesn't come from Robert Greene. So it's still a conundrum uh, at the moment. Um, Proudhon is another case in question. So never mind the Dillers, it still happens with other composers for which you, on a lot of the, the musical, the published music, it only has the composer's surname. Um, and so you, know, you, you search for their 
surname, except sometimes it turns out that it wasn't actually their surname. It might have been the name that they were known by, or it might have been their first name, or their middle name, or their father's name, or their dog's name, or so on. Um, and again, this is where a digital resource like Oxford Music Online falls short, because if you look for Proudhon in Oxford Music Online, there is no entry. Whereas in the, the um, Benoit's dictionary, it was very clear. I looked for Proudhon, and it says Proudhon, comma, Tiero, dit. Tiero did Proudhon. So it has an entry, I can't remember, I think it's under Tierio, where it tells you more or less everything you sort of need to know, or at least it's a starting point. Um, so we know that he flourished in the second half of the 18th century, that he made flutes, oboes, clarinets, um, and uh, bassoons. Um, he was of some repute. Um, and that his son was, was also a maker of the instruments um, and you can't really tell their work apart, which is always helpful to find. Um, but they are, they're all stamped Proudhon. So we know it was either father or son, at least it's a starting point, at least we've got some, some dates there. Um, here's a typical sort of title page. Um, and Senae is one of the composers that I have actually managed, managed to find out uh, at least dates. Um, but as you can see here, it says uh, sonatas, Senea's sonatas adjusted for musettes and vielles. Now, Senea was, a, was a, another um, violinist, a virtuoso violinist. So I assumed that these are violin sonatas, but I haven't managed to find a trace in any work list of any violin sonatas that Senea uh, wrote. So I sort of hit a, a brick wall there. Um, uh, a similar occasion occurred with a, with a colleague, actually, who found, um, in fact, was a friend of a, a colleague who's not even a musettist, but is interested in musette, um, who was looking for Scarlatti keyboard sonatas and came across um, Scarlatti's, I think it was four keyboard sonatas, again, in the Bibliothèque Nationale, um, and was struck by the fact that there are figures, uh, there's figure bass in at least one of them. Um, they did some digging and realized that Scarlatti didn't publish an opus four, um, so they're obviously by someone else. Um, I showed them to this friend who's interested in Musette, and he said, well, oh, it's, it's in French by Linclef. Um, and actually, it, it's, the range is, is of Musette. Um, and it turns out, having sort of passed them around the Musette community, that the, actually they're probably one of Nicolas Chirivier's uh, that he just passed off as, um, as Scarlatti, which is quite bold, actually, when you think about it. Um, and you wonder why nobody noticed at the time that this was a keyboard sonata with figured bass. But there you go. Um, so it's kind of filled with these lovely illuminations and slight pitfalls um, that both make you utterly frustrated, but also kind of keep you going as well. Um, at least you can laugh at them. Um, so I'm still working my way through my various lists, and I'm fairly confident that I will still be able to find some details, particularly in Fetis and in the um, Bumwa's uh, dictionary. Um, but I'm still stuck with uh, Colin Charpentier. Um, and you might ask why I got so hooked on Colin Charpentier. It's partly because of this, uh, these, he wrote six books of amusement. Now they're quite large, these books. There's a lot of music in there. Um, and we can assume probably, well, it, it, given the lack of evidence otherwise, anyway, we can assume that he probably wrote them as um, pièces de chambre, so they would, we know that Musette was used, for example, um, by Louis XIV um, in his you know, chambers to, as music to go to sleep to, and music to, to wake up to. I mean, what better way to wake up um, than having a bagpack next to your ear? Um, <laughs> And we know this from people, other composers' works that are labelled as such, and they, they're traceable. Um, Charpentiers, we actually have no idea where they were played, but they would suit that sort of field. Um, they are quite simple, so maybe they were written for the amateur market, but we don't have any trace of Charpentier being linked to the amateur market. The only link we have with him is that he played, um, he made his debut at court, and he played for the Concert Spirituel, most of which was fielded by court orientated musicians and composers. And the other interesting thing about these is that they're scored simply for musette and really bassoon 
I suppose it's not that weird because they're both double reed instruments, um, but it's not a combination that we see anywhere else. Um, they do also fit very well on cello, which again is quite an unusual instrument for this period. Um, the usual bowed bass instrument being the, the bass viol, uh, France being a late adopter of the cello. Um, they're not uh, at all suited to the bass viol. Um, and so they sort of stand out in a way as being these books of sort of interesting um, music that whose provenance and, and details elude us, which I find I keep coming back to. Um, I also play them quite a lot in, in uh, performances um, because they, they make lovely sort of opening pieces, a lovely change of, of texture. Um, and in fact, I thought, I'd, having talked for so long, um, I'll give you a little sneak preview of one of the tracks actually from my album. There's a, a small amount of, of one of the, this first book of Unusable, just so you can hear something of what it is about the sound. you can appreciate quite the, the sort of beauty of them. Um, so what I'd hoped to sort of present really neatly was a kind of 
percentage of composers still unknown um, and, and piece it all together in a kind of nice you know, Venn diagram or something. Um, once I'd embarked upon this, I realised actually I have so much more work still to do before I can even begin to, to do any of that. Um, and I was thinking, what else, what conclusions have I drawn from this? What has been a relatively piecemeal sort of exercise simply because um, of the, the various avenues that you have to kind of look down. Um, the number of resources consulted has been far fewer than I would have expected. Um, there is, there's nothing that stands out as being an unusual source. Um, the, the sort of the thing that stands out actually is the relatively small number of articles and books dedicated to Musette, which I think there, there aren't any books. Um, and the, the number of relatively unknown composers compared to, say, con contemporary composers in the UK. Um, maybe this is partly because of cultural bias, except that when I have asked um, French scholars about this, it, it confirms sort of the conclusions that I've arrived at. Um, drawing up just a quick list of the sources that I have looked at, um, actually, there's nothing again that, that really stands out. The usual kind of view, Oxford awesome Music Online, Google Scholar, Gallica, IMSLP, um, uh, I've looked a bit at RISM, um, correspondence with, with scholars and enthusiasts actually has been invaluable. Um, there are a few articles that mention Musette, but there's nothing significant in any one of them. And then this uh, Fetty's biography. Um, Robert Greene's book on the Hurdy Gurdy. Um, there's a little bit of interest in Leopard, uh, Leopard's book Arcadia at Versailles, which is largely, largely an icono iconographical book. Um, and, and Benoit's uh, Dictionnaire, too. Um, in terms of new search techniques, that's been actually for me the, the hardest thing, which is um, moving beyond the, the kind of musical logical approved, learned search techniques that I've used for, for many years, um, um, which you know, stand up to peer review and, and scrutiny. Um, I've had, those are, most of them have actually largely failed. And so I've had to kind of go down the route of looking at Wikipedia, even as a starting point, or um, following my notes about something, hearing about it from someone else and thinking, ah, oh, I'll follow that up, see where I get with it. And most importantly, Going back to the music, I'm constantly going back to these 18th century prints of the music itself um, to see if I can trace something uh, via that. Um, so the conclusions that I've come to so far are that I need to do a lot more work on this um, and that there really is a huge difference between the, the two fields of scholarship that I've inhabited um, and probably others as well, and therefore, importantly, that one musicological approach really doesn't fit all scenarios, which is kind of something of, of a surprise. Um, and probably that in order to, once I've exhausted all, all the resources that I have found, what I really need to do is go to the Centre du um, Baroque Musique de Versailles, to the Bibliothèque Nationale, not as I would with Handel stuff, not armed with um, a reference number, you know, looking for a particular thing, but actually just to spend days in there getting lost and following my nose. Um, and I know that this works because actually a, a, a fellow student when I was studying in Belgium um, did exactly that, spent a few days in, Biblia, in the Biblia, Bibliothèque Nationale um, and discovered a music concerto by an Italian composer, Barbella, about which we knew absolutely nothing. Um, and it was all, you know, labelled music, etc totally clear that it's for the instrument. It just hadn't, no one had stumbled across it. Um, so I think that's probably where the, the, the research will, will sort of end up. Um, and it could potentially be a whole lifetime's work, who knows? It's, it's not unappealing, that it, let's say that much. So I shall end there. Amanda, it's really fascinating to, to hear, especially moving from Handel to, to study a, a, an instrument and a repertoire that is has the opposite problem, which is mm. a very useful thing. I wonder whether you might play us something when you've got your instrument with us and then we can get some questions. Just a thought. <laughs> <laughs>
with yes. us, that would be fabulous. Um, Amanda, can I just suggest that you switch on original sound because it's off, and that's why people are getting kissing it. Okay. Can you get that back? Back to the Zoom window. Oh, fine. Can I stop sharing? I've got a bit rained it. Stop sharing. Is the sound coming from there or? It's when you go off the top, yeah. so it says the original sound mm. off the wall. It should be on that. Um, we can't yeah, actually right. see it on there. Oh, I wonder if it's on oh, here. It'll be that one then. Yeah. Somebody wants to help us. We got it. Sound off, yeah, brilliant. Oh, yeah, shit, one bit. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Good play. This is uh, so the first method um, or treatise for Musette was written by um, a Bourgeon de Scalery. Um and the second part of that uh, piece is for Musette, it was published in 1672 um, and the pieces published in the back of that are pastoral so they're Branlers, um, some songs, we, this is how we know actually that uh, Musette players would sometimes sing um, it's quite hard to do, I have done that, I'm not going to do it today um, uh, but it's Yes, it's definitely, we know that it was done because of, it's, it's in the back of this treaty. So I'll just play you um, a couple of the Bronlers from the back of this treaty. Listen to much more of that. I'm sure our audience who are enjoy joining us from Zoom or on YouTube would agree with us. Um, it's really fascinating to hear of an instrument that where people are coming at it from very different directions, from the sort of bagpiping mm. tradition, um, so it had sort of roots in a more, uh, I guess, vernacular, or and then also a courtly um, sort of higher status instrument too. So yeah. could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. There's one of the things that's really, I found really fascinating actually, um, is as far as I know, it's the only instrument that really has this, this crossover um, view that had it in its original life. Um, we know that it was in its earliest form, it was still played in its earliest form in the field when it was still being, you know, when it was played in a slightly more developed form in the, the courts at, at Versailles. Um, and actually, sort of interestingly, I talked about this at the beginning, there's still this 
um, sort of crossover. It's a very gentle crossover, actually, um, in the, the sort of modern musette world. But I think it's one of the things that um, that I find interesting and that really feeds my own musicological research is actually observing the different approaches um, of players who come from the world of traditional music. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a totally different field, totally, totally different approach, totally different sort of attitude towards an old instrument. Mm -hmm. um, they will play you know, a piece of, of chez um, but they might program it alongside um, I don't know, a folk tune from there that they might play on their on their own pipes. There's, there isn't this complete distinction, which I think is very healthy, especially for the resurgence of an instrument. Um, there aren't. There, there's a couple of um, new pieces being written for it, but it hasn't sort of emerged enough, I think, to engage with that level. But I think it could be a very easy um, sort of path for it to take, which will then, of course, help with the regeneration process as well. Um, but for me, I find it's, it's the attitudes and the the ways of finding and crucially sharing information as well that really comes into play when when these two worlds mm. sort of collide. And I've been really, um, I feel very fortunate actually in having access to the, the traditional world. I mean, I've learned a lot about bagpipes, mm. the bagpipes that I never knew existed. They're absolutely amazing ones. <laughs> um, so I feel it's actually added to my own kind of musicianship mm. and mm. you know, creative development as well. That's fascinating. It's an instrument that exists in many different forms in so many different mm. um, countries and contexts. Yes. Passport um, to the world. That's what we were always told at school. Passport to the world. Passport to the world, <laughs> yes. Bank you grew up in Scotland, though. So. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I'm sure our, our English colleagues might not share that, <laughs> that view. <laughs> Great. There's lots I, I, I still want to ask, but please, I'd like to open up to the floor. And if you are asking a question up there in the room, please really speak loudly and uh, quite short because it's actually quite hard to pick up. David. Yes, um, Jane, can you hear me if I speak like this? Yes, beautifully, thank you. Thanks. Um, so this might seem like a, a really kind of simple technical question, in which case I apologise. But I noticed, Amanda, thanks very much, by the way, that was, that was really brilliant. We were doing these, uh, what we would call nowadays, tambourine trills to get vibrato, mm. and I was just wondering what the provenance of that is, if, if we know that this would have been our technique of playing. I mean, it sounded great, I loved it, I'm just wondering if there's any kind of manuals for performing this, this kind of instrument. There's, the only place that we see any kind of um, mention of technique is um, in uh, Bourgeon Descalery's treatise and then the other treatise which was published by Hotter in, oh, I forget the exact date, uh, 1763 I think, around then. Um, and there it's very sporadic. Hotter mentions um, using trills but doesn't mention how it's achieved. So you have to it's a bit sort of guesswork um, and some of them you can't trill on all the same and, you, and vibrato the same um, so we kind of piece together particularly with Hotter his mention of vibrato and trills um, and to some extent articulation uh, you can refer to his other treatises you know, for, for wind instruments to get an idea of what he means and then kind of try to recreate it um, the other thing which you um, might have noticed in the Charpentier clip that I played you it sounds like the sound disappears at some point and that's because um, the joke in my chamber ensembles is that having been, you know, as a recorder player, you famously can't do dynamics. Um, as a musette player, you can't either. Um, I know the harpsichordist, really, and you know, they, we can all fake it, essentially. So quite often, the cellist is the only person in the room who can do any kind of dynamics. So we leave it to her. Um, but uh, modern musettists have tried to come up with an, uh, an answer to this, which is simply that you do that. So you start off. works. It's a bit tricky when you're standing up, especially if you've got heels on. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, but I, it is possible in performance, as long as you've got kind of you know, a steady foot, or if you're sitting down, obviously. But yeah, it's interesting how players, I think, just naturally kind of push these boundaries and think, how can I find that sound? Um, and the same with makers as well. There's all sorts of fixes that makers, even in the 18th century, did, because we can tell from historical musettes, you find strange rods inserted, or a little conical um, tube 
to try and change the pitch of an instrument or to um, make the, the range slightly wider. Some of them are more successful than others. Some of them have um, bits chopped out of them uh, as well. So there, there was, I think there's always been quite a lot of trial and error <laughs> when it comes to both the making and the, and the playing. It's really fascinating. I think this sound wasn't working very well over Zoom, so there was, it was oh, a distortion, shame. which is unfortunate. Um, I do have a question from Jane, because I'm checking the chat here. That's why I brought the, the laptop. But Jenny, you go first and speak really, really loudly, and then we'll come to Jane in a second. It's fine, honestly. Um, can you hear me? It must be like this. Is that all right? Yeah. Really interesting, Amanda. Thanks so much. Just um, a quick question and two quick comments. Really, something that struck me was you mentioned the word novelty a couple of times. And I thought it would be really interesting to unpack that, what the implications of something being a novelty and novelty in what way. Mm. That was very interesting. Um, something else that struck me was you saying that your, the practicalities of your professional practice have impacted the extent of your knowledge of repertoire. And I thought that was very fascinating. Um, it reminds of our responsibilities here, mm -hmm. I guess. And then the third comment was about research and the comment about um, not using uh, valid research techniques and searches, but having to find other ways. And I thought that was fascinating because, of course, Wikipedia is a valid source because it's your integrity as a researcher, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So there's, some, there's three really interesting things there about you know, the content that you, your practice and mm -hmm. how you come to this and, and knowledge and research and feel free to unpack mm. any of those or <laughs> which oh, it's one funny. Want to. Yeah. No, you're, it's entirely true, and in some ways, um, I feel like I've kind of been let loose with musettes in a way because there aren't these parameters that we ourselves, I guess, to some extent, put in place. Like you say, you know, um, we're brought up with this idea of what is constitutes proper research proper music um, and we're I mean anybody learning an instrument growing up is to some extent corralled by the music of their teacher um, and of you know, exam lists festival lists competition lists etc um, and then in your working life of course you're limited by what's been programmed for you the exception being of course chamber music um, but then other factors come into play like what sells tickets and this, of course, is something that I explore on a daily basis with, uh, with my organisation, Baroque in the North, um, is, you know, what concerts can we put on with what funding? How much do we need to make back from ticket sales? And therefore, what can we programme? Which seems the totally the wrong way around, doesn't it? Um, this is where, actually, I have total freedom with Musette, because nobody's ever going to come to a concert that, that features you know, Musette composers solely on the basis of the composers. So in a way, I can programme what I like it's because they come to see the instrument. So I feel like I've got a lot more freedom around yeah, repertoire choices. And actually that's fed through to my violin repertoire because I thought to myself, I really need to know these composers. I, I need to know what their violin repertoire, I need to know more about the French early 18th century school of playing. So that's kind of opened my, up my own horizons there. Um, I don't uh, currently teach um, much in the way of you know, sort of private students but when I'm doing coaching sessions and running the Brock Orchestra um, at the university across the road that feeds into that so we did a whole concert of um, French Noels um, pre-lockdown um, so it definitely has impacted in lots of different areas I can't remember whether that's covered all your points or not actually um, the novelty well the novelty yes there's, there's something in there isn't there about it being a novel instrument Absolutely. It's very positive. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there are accounts of Louis XIV playing Musette in his um, pastoral themed soirees in um, Versailles, surrounded by sheep. And he used to wear, um, he'd, he'd dress up in peasant clothes. Um, they were still silk, but they'd be like a couple of inches shorter. Yeah. Um, so there, it was definitely a novelty instrument. But what's interesting is that it goes beyond that, sort of past the novelty status and is adopted as a high art kind of serious instrument. So it, yeah, it's, it's really funny for many ways. Great, I, I have a, a question from Jane who is uh, on the screen. It's really asking about decibels and really with a, an ear to the Scottish bagpipe. 
where the Royal Conservatory of Scotland, they were limited to 15 minutes a day. But I think the, the decibels aren't really quite as significant, which no. maybe doesn't come across on, on Zoom. But do you want that's, to yeah, that's true. Actually, that? it's, a, it's a very strange concept, actually. I haven't measured the decibels, um, but certainly one of the reasons that I learned music was that I regretted not having learned Highland Pipes at school, um, and I thought, I'll take up bagpipes as a hobby. Um, Post-PhD, I've got time for a hobby. Um, uh, and then I thought, I live in a semi-detached house, you know, Manchester, 1930s, brick walls. My neighbour, much as she loves, she, th yeah, she says she loves us practising, there's got to be a line somewhere, so Highland Pipes, out of the question. Um, <laughs> Although I suppose it's always true of the water park, but you know. Um, and then I thought, or maybe Northumbrian pipes, because they're much quieter and you know, I could, I, we're relatively close to teachers, etc. Um, and then I did a, a French opera, one of the Lily operas with Musettes. Um, and I saw this and I thought, oh, I could just tie it in with other things that I do, that would be nice. Um, and actually, interestingly, I've asked my, on a, a very sort of local level, I've asked my neighbour actually which of the three instruments she can hear most, and between violin, uh, musette, recorder, and my husband plays piano a lot, um, and she said actually the one that she can hear most through the walls is recorder. So there must be something about the timbre as well. Fascinating. We, Anna has got a question, so Anna, do you want to, to ask it? Uh, thank you. Yes, um, that was really interesting, uh, Amanda. I want to know if you used RISM to source um, material, because uh, you didn't mention it, you may well have used it. Um, but I just had a quick look and there are quite a lot of entries on there. Yes, so I've started to use RISM, um, but I haven't uh, done it extensively yet. It's sort of on my, it's my next, next bit of hit list. Um, the, the sources that I have found on there um, repeat the ones that I've already found, that I've already got. Um, but that's not to say, I haven't, I haven't done an exhaustive um, look at search through it yet. But I think, I, my feeling is that there's more on offer there. So I'm fairly sure that I'll find something of interest there. Yeah. I've also noticed that Jane mentioned pitch. Um, pitch is the bane of uh, everyone's existence in, in the historically informed performance world. Um, this instrument's at 415, which is great because that's the very standardised pitch that most Baroque ensembles play at um, now, with particular chamber music in this country. Um, but in fact, if I'm uh, playing in France, this music will be played at 392, mm -hmm. which meant, of course, I had to commission another instrument um, to play at 392 um, uh, of this size. Um, but what we find with a lot of the historical musettes is that they exist at around 400, um, which is interesting in itself. Um, so it's, it's the usual picture of many different pictures, and we're having to come up with a modern alternative. I'm, I'm really interested also in sources, so picking up on Anna's point and uh, thinking about French um, libraries and things. And, um, the BNF has got quite quite a lot of the um, quite a lot of the composers you were mentioning. So I was having a little look just because I'm so used to you looking at the BNF catalogue. Um, and a composer who did nothing for Colin, by the way, but quite a lot on some of the others. But uh, André Compa comes up quite a lot, and I wonder whether he'd he'd come across your thing. And the reason I'm asking that is because. Annie and Corette came into my, my vision when I was working on Mio because Mio was um, using elements of them, often hidden and, and not acknowledged in his own work when he went into more of a so-called um, so um, uh, sort of classical mm -hmm. or Baroque because the French regard this repertoire as classic mm -hmm. and, and hence the revival and the golden age of this music in the early 20th or late 19th mm -hmm. and early 20th century. Um, but over to he you, does but those three composers figure a lot in Neil's work yeah. at that time, and they're using, yes, they're using Musette. Yeah, and it's interesting, and it's interesting that they're picked up on again mm. um, later, because that goes along with the iconography and the re-emergence of the Musette in paintings mm. towards the end of the 19th century. Um, so again, in this year, so celebration of the, the, the glory years. Um, so Anne and Corette, uh, both feature on my, my major yeah. composer list. Compra, I haven't come across any instrumental music. He oh, uses okay. Musette in one of the early, uh, one of his operas. Uh, 
yeah. right, the, the list of opera that okay. doing there somewhere. Um, I think it's one, or maybe it's three. Um, three. So he uses it in Pomone, yeah. Ariane, so and there. Le Pene Plaisir yeah. Interesting. Very yeah. Interesting. Mm. So maybe there's more to find from yeah. Compra. And I, I also wondered um, the Roymont, the, the library there, which our international chair has um, produced mm -hmm. a catalogue of the, the resources there. I wondered whether they're oversight, of course, uh, yeah. as places where you, uh, because of that, the, the French yes. courtly yeah. um, yes. association. Like yes, actually, yeah. I came across Denis' name in the Benoit's Dictionnaire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also Florence Gatreau, who's another mm -hmm. uh, contributor who, yeah, who's, yeah, she's compiled an excellent bibliography mm -hmm. of Musette. Um, she's been following. Musette for, for a number of years oh, um, via paintings okay. and iconography. So that sort of network's really interesting because I know when you had your travels with my Musette, it was very much on social media, yes. you were bringing together a sort of network of, of performers and, and, and scholars and other interested people from mm. very different traditions. Yeah. So uh, are there any more questions? We've got more in the chat, so maybe if there are questions, I'll quickly check. Ah yes, that was the, the pitch at the end. Uh, we have a, a summer series of concerts um, running uh, across Derbyshire. Um, it's a project initiative of Brock and uh, North, known as Brock and Beyond, where we take live music to places that don't no, doesn't normally have uh, live music. It's all about making it accessible, um, etc. So you can see on the screen the list of places that do come along. Kicks off this weekend. Wonderful, Gavin. You've got a question. Thanks, Amanda. It's, uh, I could listen to that instrument all day. That's mm. a uh, favourite instrument. Um, I'm just wondering if you could outline any uh, sort of developments across that hundred years of the sort of scores that we have, of how the instrument developed, or was used, how it was developed its usage in the kind of music today. Um, and it's a real shame that it sort of stopped with the French Revolution, because I think with that, um, that Colin Chopin mm -hmm. piece, it sounded a bit like foray to me. And it's just mm. really interesting to sort of see how, you know, maybe to sort of imagine how it might have developed. Mm. I think it's, it's, it's quite a musical chameleon, I think. Um, I haven't tried extensively playing other repertoire, but certainly in terms of um, songs, I mean, you, you, you play along with the early songs in the Bourgeon de Scalery, you know, 1672 treaties. Um, French traditional song doesn't really change still the traditional song and so when you hear it later in the new chanson actually it's not that far removed from how you hear it in the 17th century so where it is accompanied by musette so I think there is this thread of traditional music that really sort of carries through um, in terms of how its repertoire develops um, from what I've been able to trace so far it follows largely the trends of other French music and other instrumental music at the same, during the same period. Um, the difference is, so in terms of you know, the adoption of Italianate um, elements, um, the adherence to some degree of, you know, to French dance suites, um, the kind of pastoral element that keeps coming back. But the difference is that the, the range of the, the music varies um, with the development of the instrument itself. So we start off with a single chalamo instrument, to which is added the petit chalamo, um, these various keys are added so that you then get a wider range. Um, it's got a, this instrument has a range of about a tenth, um, and it's almost fully chromatic. And so we start to see the, the chromaticism used more as composers. They didn't really make any allowance for the drones, actually. So um, music modulates at the same rate and in the same way as music for violin or oboe. Um, you know, droneless instruments. So the drone is just kind of ignored, um, which is a, an interesting point in, it, in itself. So that doesn't, the composers don't let that, doesn't let, don't let the drones hold them back in, in terms of modulation and keys. Um, but it's really this use of the, the pretty chalamo, which is the tricky bit, the trickier bit, um, versus only on the grand chalamo that tells us whether the music was written for the amateur market or the virt virtuoso market. So they kind of, it all comes together in a large kind of melting pot. Mm. 
a number of years ago, you had the, the, the idea of try, um, trying to commission a number of composers to, to write for the, the musette. And that could yes, oh, it's still, still there. there. It's still wonderful. It's the idea is still there. Wonderful idea. Yes. So if any volunteers or composers <laughs> who yes. would like to do that, it would be a fascinating thing to do, to yes. try and, and uh, explore that, this instrument. Yeah, the next project. <laughs> do we have any final questions? Or perhaps we can continue more informally in the bar. So I'd like to thank Amanda for a really fascinating talk and performance of um, from the, t telling us lots about them that we didn't know. So thank you very much. <laughs>